Yeah, what's up, Mission? How's everybody doing today? Awesome. My name is Jody Hickerson. I want to welcome those of you who are online right now on the lobby or on the patio this beautiful day. It is so good um, to be together. We are in a series right now called This Is Us. And what we're doing in this series is we're, we're revisiting and we're teaching through five values that God has led us to as a church that make up the DNA of mission. Like, like what makes mission mission? So if you're new around Mission Men, welcome. This is a great series to jump into and go, okay, what, is, what are these church people all about? And like Mike said last week, um, the church is not a building, right? It's never been about the, the steeple thing. It's always been about the people thing. And so the building is a tool. It's a great tool. But the building is only that we, the people, are what make up the church. And so when we walk out of here, the church has left the building. Like we are the church. We make a mission. So as we dive into these five values, they all come from scripture, which is, you know, important that God has led us to. We got to know this is us. We're carriers of this DNA. It's every single individual carrying out this type of DNA. And so um, these are the five things. Last week we talked about tangible hope, um, that we always, always will be a church full of people whose doors are wide open to anyone to come experience hope for everyone through Jesus Christ. That anyone is welcome and no one is perfect, but change is possible because there's hope for us. And the, and the welcome mat will always be out. For anyone who wants to come home here. And so I mean, if you missed last week's message, really want to encourage you to jump on the app and listen. Because offering hope, tangible hope, and being hope dealers in our community, it's a real big deal around here. I mean, you see hope for everyone hugely written about on the wall as you walk in. That is such a big deal around here. And it's who we are as individuals. Today we're going to talk about practical help. We're already jumping into that. Next week, life-changing ministry. It's in incredible what goes on during the weekend and throughout the week um, through this church community. Throw great parties is one of our top five values. And you may be like, where do you find that in scripture? It's all over the Bible, y'all. Jesus liked to party. And so we're a church that throws great parties and then kingdom impact that is not only what God is doing here, but man, what's he doing in the kingdom? How can we join his kingdom work? And it's just gonna be such a fun series to look at and go, man, this is us. We are a part of this. We are carriers of this DNA. And today we get to dream a little and celebrate a little and be challenged together around what it means for us as individuals who carry this DNA to extend practical help to people who need it. I had the privilege of being on the team that, that moved here to start mission, uh, praying about what this church would be before it ever had a name. Honestly, being a part of this community and, and what God has done, man, it's absolutely transformed my life. It is the faith adventure I cannot imagine missing out on. And so I've been a part of this church community the last 12 years, um, you know, praying about it for like 14. Y'all have seen me, you know, go from not having to color my hair to cover my gray. And uh, our girls go from 2, 5, and 8 to 21, 18, and 15. I mean, this, this church community has been transformational in my life and in our lives. And one of the key questions, I'm just letting you know, in the early days of dreaming about and praying about what kind of church would this be? What would the DNA be? There was a question that inspired us, and it was this question. If Mission Church closed its doors, would the city be sad or would they even notice? Like, if we didn't exist tomorrow, we'd be sad, but would our community care? And that question from the beginning sparked a desire to not try to be the best church in the city, right? But to be the best church that we can be for the city. Offering practical help anywhere we can. Because listen, when you look at scripture and you look at the life of Jesus, it's just really hard to ignore how important it is to extend practical help meeting the needs of people. 
This is what birthed in our DNA partnerships with dozens of local organizations doing amazing work. Give one every single week, meeting the needs of families and individuals, item of the month, space for recovery meetings, care team, crisis relief, um, child sponsorships, Feed 805, and on and on. Because we want to be a church, a, a group of people that are making a difference in our community and beyond. We want to be good neighbors. Jesus talked about being good neighbors a lot. I'm gonna, we're going to walk through a passage today that um, maybe you've kind of heard of, or maybe you've heard a hospital named after this dude, um, or an organization. Maybe you know it well. Maybe you've heard it here because it is a part of our DNA. Um, but check this out. It's in Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, uh, so we're going to stop right here because there's a couple things to know. This guy is an expert in the law. So he's like religious laws, what he's talking about here. And it says that he asked this question to what? To test Jesus. That's why he's throwing this question out. The religious leaders at the time didn't like it all that Jesus had this big following. So they're always trying to stump him publicly, trap him, trick him, test him. Like we're going to get him caught in some sort of answer. So he's trying to discredit him. And, and Jesus knows this. This dude already assumed he was good. Like he was good with God. He had eternal life. It's just like, what will Jesus say? So Jesus knows this. He knows he's being tested. And you'll notice in scripture that anytime someone asks Jesus a question to test him, Jesus responds with a question, which I love. So Jesus responds, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Like, you are the expert, right? <laughs> you already think you got this, so what do you think? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Jesus is like, you got it, man. You're 100% on the quiz, so I'm just gonna leave. And he's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? I mean, it was pretty clear. Love God and love people. But now he's asking, well, who exactly is my neighbor? Like, who do I actually have to love? Like, narrow this down for me, Jesus, because some would say a neighbor is someone who lives close by, or a neighbor is someone who is ethnically similar, or, or a neighbor is someone who are other religious Jewish people, or are or, or my neighbors only those who are ceremonial clean like me? Like, who is my neighbor? Who do I got to love? And Jesus tells a story, which I love. In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So Jesus is telling a made-up story to illustrate his point. He made this up, but he's talking about an actual road that the people there were familiar with. The road to Jericho was 17 miles long, and it was a dangerous road. Um, during, the, during the trip, it descended 3,300 feet. It was known for this kind of thing, for robberies and stuff. So we got this guy traveling a steep, dangerous road, and he gets robbed and stripped and beaten and left half dead. Or for you Princess Brides fans, he's mostly dead, okay? That's this dude. And he's laying there and he's wondering, is anyone gonna help me? Anyone gonna, gonna stop me and get me on my road to recovery? And Jesus continues, man, lucky for this guy. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. A priest in that day was the highest ranking religious leader. And you know, scholars, biblical scholars have written about like, why didn't the priest stop? We don't know. This is a made up story, right? <laughs> Jesus is making up this story. All we know, and it, it leads our imagination there. It invites us into the story, right? Is it sometime between he saw the man half dead, beaten, naked on the side of the road. Sometime between that moment and the time he passed by, he made a decision that he shouldn't stop and help for some reason. So too a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him pass by on the other side. A Levite was another religious official and he passed by too. Why? We don't know. But somewhere in between seeing a man that needs help and the time that he passed him by, he had come up with some reason. Jesus continues, but a Samaritan. And the whole place, the whole group is just like gasping, right? Because there was some bad blood 
between the Jewish people and the Samaritans, between the religious leaders of the time and these Samaritans. And so they know where Jesus is going with this. And they're like, oh no, do not go there. Samaritans were hated. They were despised. They were a race of people that were discriminated against. They were offensive to the religious people because it was believed that Samaritans didn't worship in the right way. And they weren't really in with God. They weren't really God's people. They weren't true followers of God. In fact, it's recorded that religious people, Jewish people, would travel out of their way around Samaria, like go a longer way so they never had to go through it. And Jesus just throws this curveball. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Then Jesus asked the experts, the most brilliant question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. I, I, I read from a few sources this week that noted that this guy couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. Like, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? And he's like, the the one who had mercy on him, which, right? Yes, simply, it's the one who saw what needed to be done and did it. That was the neighbor. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do. Go and do. Can y'all say that? Go and do. Go and do. I kind of want to put a beat behind it. Go and do. Like this is what we're called to do. Jesus says this is it. And so I just want to talk about real practically for us, what does this look like in our individual lives? What does this look like when we come together as a church community to be people that are going and doing? And the first thing is that we got to embrace the greatest commandment, which is simply love God, love God people. Like this comes from Jesus. Again, when someone else was trying to trap him and, and test him, they're like, hey, so what do you think the greatest commandment is? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments, love God and love people. Like invest in this relationship with God, with all you got, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and invest in the people around you with love. Love. And love is more than a feeling. Love is an emotion. Love is an action. Love shows up, doesn't it? Love listens. Love cares. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love moves from your eyes to your heart, to your mind, to your wallet, to your hands, to your feet. And our world needs love. And listen, if you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this is our greatest commandment. Love God and love people. You wake up every day and you ask, how can I love God today and how can I love people today? It's not only the greatest commandment that we've got. Jesus said it's how this world would know that we're his. He said, and they will know that you're my disciples by your love. Wouldn't that be amazing? If, if we were known that we're his, not by our church affiliation or political party or family heritage or denomination or what we say or what we defend or what we support, but by how we love people, love God and love people. And then there's a phrase we say around here all the time that applies to us as individuals living out this DNA. We can't do everything, but we can do something. 
so many of us, I know our hearts here are like, yes, I want to make a difference with my life. I want to help. I want to leave a legacy. I want to be part of the solution. But also, I get really overwhelmed by the stats of people suffering. And I don't even know where to start. And I don't even think what I could give, what I could offer would even make a dent. And so we trend toward not doing anything because we overcomplicate this and we get overwhelmed by this. Here's what I mean by overcomplicated. We have created an unrealistic standard for what it means to be someone who like makes a difference in this world. I mean, some of this is because of social media and what we see all day. And we, we're looking at people who run organizations and families who are fostering or have adopted or, or that guy who opened the gym or the mom whose Instagram following has exploded or that leader that's killing it or that person who wrote a book or that amazing speaker or that incredible nonprofit leader. And we're just looking at it all going, man, I should be all that. When none of us could be all that. We should all over ourselves and think, man, I should be doing something like that. What am I even doing with my life? And that is insane. God created you to be you. We overcomplicate it and we get overwhelmed, which is normal, right? We see the news. We see the images of refugees washed up on shores, the plight of poverty in undeveloped countries. We see the footage of the attacks in Israel, the, the racial tension in our world, natural disasters. We hear stats like there are 27 million people in slavery right now across our world through human trafficking and that nearly 2 billion people in the world live on less than $2 a day. And then you compound that with closed tragedies in our life, a neighbor that's going through a divorce. A friend that's got a sick child, a friend that's, that's relapsed, a coworker who was in an accident, and then we got our own stuff right. <laughs> Trouble in our own relationships or in our marriage or financial weight or we can't find a job or we got a kid that's really struggling. It, it can be overwhelming. I mean, if you weren't overwhelmed when you came in today, you know, here, you probably are now, right? And this is the problem, and it's frustrating because we can't fix it all or understand it all, or change it all. But listen, that doesn't mean we don't do anything. The truth is, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And let's not get paralyzed by, by overcomplicating it or, or being overwhelmed by it. We don't have to be gifted in a certain way, talented in a certain way, have a following or a platform or run an organization or have a best-selling book to do something. That's just not true. And listen, you may not change the world, but I guarantee you, you can change someone's world. Which leads me to our next principle. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. This is a principle I learned from another pastor uh, years ago. It's absolutely wrecked me. And it's kind of the opposite of what we learned growing up, right? Like if you asked your teacher if you could go to the bathroom, they're like, oh, if I let you go, then I have to let everybody go, right? You ask your mom for that thing at Target, and she's like, well, if I get you one, then I'll have to get everybody one. Or, or you, you, you want to go to that thing, and, and your parents are like, well, if I let you go, i got to let your brothers and sisters go. And we kind of knew, even as kids, no, you don't, right? Like, that's not true. But we carry this into adulthood, and we see all of this need, but we end up doing nothing because we can't do it for everyone. So we don't invite those people over because we can't invite everybody over. And we don't invest in that relationship because we can't invest in every relationship. And listen, in our attempt to like be fair, we miss out on opportunities to bring real practical help to people who need it. Fairness is not a godly principle. You don't have to be fair. It's not about being fair. It's about doing the right thing, doing for one what you wish you could do for everyone. We can all do something for someone. So start like seeing the world this way. Start praying to God to show you one student to invest in, one couple going through a hard time, one guy or girl at your weekly meeting that needs a sponsor, one child maybe you could take in, one friend that's struggling, one, struggling, one, one kid you could sponsor. Pray as you go through your day, God, give me eyes to see so I could just do for one what I wish I could do for everyone. But don't fall into, since I can't do it for everyone, I'm not going to do it for anyone. And then go deep rather than wide. 
And this is not me uh, saying we can't be involved in like several awesome things, but I'm just saying as we start to live this out, there is something powerful about going deep with one or a few instead of spreading ourselves thin with a bunch of like more wide, shallow commitments in our life, just like helping here, helping there, helping there, you know? Think about ways that you could go deep. Like where can you go all in? How could you invest deeply into this place? How could you invest deeply into that one family, that one organization, that one student, that one teammate, that one friend, that one couple? Our tendency is to go wide and kind of keep it at the surface because it's easier than going deep. But helping people, really helping people, means we go deep rather than wide. John Orberg puts it this way, in a contagious world, we learn to keep our distance. If we get too close to those who are suffering, we might get infected with their pain. It may not be convenient or comfortable, but only when you get close enough to catch their hurt will they be close enough to catch your love. And be generous. This is practically speaking how this looks, with your time and with your resources. Right when Jesus told this story, this good Samaritan goes out of his way with time and he's giving his resources, his own oil, his own wine, his donkey. He goes to the innkeeper, he pays two silver coins and then he's like, I'll circle back and I'll pay, I'll reimburse you for all the expenses. Like this is part of what it means to bring practical help that we are generous people. This guy is extravagantly generous and listen, we have such a generous God. He has been so good to us, even if he did nothing else for us. And he asks us to live open-handed, to be generous, that our generosity as we give, it honors him, it helps others, it increases our own faith, it grows our dependence, it activates our trust, it deepens our surrender, and it leads us to thanksgiving, celebrating, like, I can't believe what God did with what I gave him. 2 Corinthians 9 puts it this way, Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity and sharing with them and everyone else. Like when we trust God for the supply and we give generously, it leads to people in the world saying, thank God for those church people. We praise God for what they give. This is why We're generous around here. We understand that we're living out of the extravagance of God and that fuels us to be extravagant towards other. And man, the church ought to be the most generous people on the planet. That is why we we give a percentage of our income to consistently empower the mission around here. And it's like, well, that seems extravagant. Well, this is us. We bring meals to our neighbors. We meet needs when we hear about them. We open our hands, our homes, our wallets, our doors to the lonely, the outcast, the hurting, the poor. We give to each other and we don't keep score. We humble ourselves so that someone else can soar. This is us. Love God, love people. Know as you walk out and you are the church, we can't do everything, but we can do something. Look for ways to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone and go deep, not just wide. And man, be generous. Can you imagine? I mean, just picture for a minute what would happen if we all lived this way. Can you imagine how different our community would be? And y'all, let me just say, when individuals living out this kind of mission come together, link arms, what God does in the whole church idea is Amazing. It is mind-blowing. And I said that we were going to celebrate a little bit today, too. And honestly, I just am so proud to be a part of this church, like a church that is living out this kind of DNA over the last 12 years. It is amazing. So check this out. 
From the very beginning of Mission, our desire has been to be a church that offers real practical help to individuals, families, our community, county, and beyond. From the start, we wanted to be the kind of church that if we ever closed our doors, the city would be sad because of the good we do in this community. Over the last 12 years, this idea of offering real practical help has moved from a dream to a reality, from vision to mission, and is only because of the generosity, the compassion, the care, and the servanthood of the people that make up mission. Being a place and a people that extend real practical help is our DNA. Through item of the month, we have been able to partner with dozens of community organizations like the Oxnard Rescue Mission, Tinder Life Maternity Home, James Storehouse, School on Wheels, Forever Found, Project Understanding, The City Center, Gabriel's House, and so many more to supply what they need to continue the important work that they do. Together, we've collected items for youth that have been trafficked, those facing homelessness, foster children and families, single mothers in transitional housing, and others in need. In addition to the items collected, $41,000 have been given directly to local community organizations making a difference. For the last 10 years, Mission has been home to several recovery meetings. AA and NA groups have met weekly at Mission for a decade, providing a space for people to find real help in getting well. It is our great privilege to open our doors to this amazing community of people. The care team at Mission responds on average to over 80 requests per month of people needing prayer, assistance, sober living expenses, financial needs, pastoral help, hospital visits, marriage mentoring, weddings, and funerals. It is incredible the ways that this team steps in and meets people right where they are to bring practical help. Incredibly, over the last 12 years, $500,000 have been given away through Give One, stepping in to help so many families and individuals pay rent, keep the lights on, get the help they need, pay for funeral expenses, and so much more. We've also had the opportunity to respond in big ways to crisis in our community. When the Thomas Fire raged in December of 2017, Mission was able to immediately become a shelter for people who were displaced. And in the days following, the people of Mission swung into action, turning the old theater on Johnson Drive into a distribution center where over 900 families came to get whatever they needed. Clothing, food, water, toiletries, diapers, pet supplies, you name it. In addition, Mission was able to give $164,000 towards Thomas Fire relief efforts, most of those funds going directly to the families that were impacted severely. In 2020, when the pandemic hit, we were able together to give $46,000 to local COVID relief efforts, providing hard to find PPE to local hospitals and medical personnel, as well as purchasing $10,000 in gift cards to local businesses when they were having a hard time keeping afloat. Coming out of the pandemic, we were made aware of the food insecurity crisis that our county was facing and Feed 805 was born to resource food share and tackling this problem. Over 1,500 volunteers were mobilized for meal packing, pop-up food pantries, and the Feed 805 food drive. Feed 805 spread countywide, partnering with over 100 county organizations, including police and fire stations, Trader Joe's, local high schools, Oxnard Libraries, the DA's office, and many more businesses to provide over 400,000 meals to families right here in Ventura County. An additional $26,000 was given to FoodShare as they continue to do incredible work feeding the people in need in our community. Meeting the practical needs of people has also gone way outside of our county lines, with People at Mission sponsoring over 500 children through Compassionate International in Guatemala and World Vision in Kalapata, Kenya. The monthly support literally meets the basic needs of food, water, and education for these children and is making a generational difference. We can't do everything, but together we can do something. Extending practical help is in our DNA. It's who we are. This is us. Woo! Dude, that's just so awesome. It's so awesome. This is us. And I just believe God wants to continue to do more and more through us as we surrender to him and live this out. Let me, let me pray for us. God, I thank you. And I thank you for who you are. Thank you for your generosity towards us. God, just how good you've been to us. 
how extravagant you've been to us, how much you've given for us. And God, I thank you so much that you invite us to be a part of the work that you're doing and, and the way that we can be people who are uh, ministers and, and ambassadors and comforters and hope dealers in our community. Thank you, God, for the privilege it is of linking arms together and partnering with you in this great work. God, would you give us new eyes to see people around us? God, would you stir in our hearts ways that we could um, be generous and go deep with people and do for one? God, would you show us and, and open our eyes to see just the simple ways every single day that we can love you more and love people well? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.